to another high-profile murder trial, 18-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse, uh, who is on trial for shooting and killing two men and injuring a third during a Black Lives Matter protest last year in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Testimony today centered around the only man to survive the shooting that day. Gage Cross Crossgrouts uh, spent more than three hours on the witness stand today. He described the injuries he suffered that day and walked the jury through his encounter with Rittenhouse, who he believed was an active shooter. Take a listen. I wouldn't say that there was more people joining, but I, more people were then pointing out the defendant, saying that he had just shot somebody, uh, that he's trying to get away, get him, things of, of that nature. And then so again, further inferencing from the things that I heard and experienced, witnessed earlier in the night, I thought that the defendant was um, an active shooter. My legal experts, Paul Henderson and Molly Palmer, are still with me and are going to weigh in. Paul, saying this is an important witness for the prosecution is an understatement. Uh, this guy was the only one to survive a gunshot fired from Rittenhouse and could essentially speak um, for the two others who didn't survive. Your reaction to his testimony today? Uh, I think it's really important, uh, especially because we have a survivor of this attack, and it would be uh, silly of me not to make the connection of its relevance while we are talking about the heels of the Ahmaud Aubrey case that we are talking about yet another case about vigilanteism. And again, this is part of the reason why many of those laws have been repealed. We know that they come from a past bit of what was necessary in this country as determined by lawmakers. And so, again, we're having a conversation that you know, we have to say it, at least here and on this network, to talk about it directly. This is another case that is centered around interpretations of race issues. And that is absolutely at the heart of this conversation. But today's witness was really important uh, because he really articulated well as the only survivor of the, of the encounter that was had with this defendant in this case. And so I think the jury is going to lean in. This is probably the most relevant testimony in terms of the prosecution that they're going to have to work with to try and countermine and undermine the defense's uh, supposition in the case, which is, again, that this was self-defense, that he thought that he was justified in exerting lethal force against all of these people, the two people that he killed, and this third person that he shot and exercised lethal force against, lethal force against as well. All right, this witness who was a paramedic um, was helping injured protesters that night and was also carrying a pistol in his right hand and a cell phone filming the encounter in his left. Video showed he had his hands up to surrender to Rittenhouse, but the defense focused on what happened next. Here's part of their cross-examination. Uh, Kyle Rittenhouse's attorney says, when you were standing three to five feet from him with your arms up in the air, he never fired. It wasn't up. Uh, it wasn't until you pointed your gun at him, advanced on him with your gun, now your hands down, pointed at him, that he fired. And that to which the witness responded, correct. Molly, did he just help the defense prove self-defense? Honestly, I think he did. And one of the things I wish I would have seen during the prosecution's presentation of this witness, I wish they would have pulled out these bad facts a little bit better because we heard mm. this witness say, in, in response to the cross-examination that, yes, I had my gun pointed. And I wish that the prosecutor would have brought that out in his direct examination and addressed it and explained the circumstances. But now I think the jury, unfortunately, is perceiving this witness as potentially not credible, but certainly uh, admitting to pointing his gun at Rittenhouse prior to the shooting from Rittenhouse, which is incredibly problematic for the prosecution's case. Paul, your thoughts? I, I agree completely. And it, it seems more damning when the evidence comes out from the prosecution side. And I think that when, when the evidence come out, comes out from the defense side, I believe the prosecution should have elicited that information and explained it or had the witness explain what he was doing. Like, they were shooting all around. I was trying to help someone. I had my gun in my hand and didn't realize I had pulled my gun out to defend myself because I thought I was going to be shot. I had my phone out and I was trying to record it. And so as I was coming towards him, 
I was not attacking him. I wasn't about to shoot him. Those are the kinds of testimony, and that's the kind of foundation that needed to be elicited that can now only come back out on cross-examination, on recross-examination, to, or to recall your own witness. And that just confuses a jury, I think. There was a direct way to elicit that information that I thought would have been more palatable for a jury to understand the complicated nature of disproving self-defense in this case. And this was a missed opportunity from prosecution. That witness in particular and that line of questioning was an absolute win for defense. And you will hear reference to that exact question and that exact answer in the future as defense argues to affirm an interpretation of that moment as self-defense, which could justify or diminish the accountability for the other victims that are dead that were shot by this defendant in this case. Well, the defense has said that uh, Rittenhouse will take the stand in his own defense, which could happen this week. Molly, the defense has already had favorable favorable rulings on their side um, and had an effective cross-examination of the only survivor who admitted to pointing his gun at their client. Is it necessary for Rittenhouse to take the stand? You know, honestly, if I was his lawyer, I would probably advise him not to based on the prosecution's presentation thus far. There's enough, I think. There's enough. Under Wisconsin law, uh, the prosecution has to disprove beyond a reasonable doubt that Rittenhouse was acting in self-defense. I don't think they're there yet. But here's the thing. The decision to testify is left up to the defendant. And so I have a feeling that Kyle Rittenhouse himself is insisting on doing this. So it might even be against his attorney's advice. But yes, he's going to take the stand, subject himself to cross-examination, and that could have a tremendous bearing on this case. Uh, Paul, as former prosecutors, you know we we salivate at the chance of getting our, our cross-examination on a defendant because it so rarely, rarely, rarely happens. So if Rittenhouse actually does take the stand, what, how would you handle that cross-examination on the prosecution side? Oh, my gosh. There is so much there that you could begin with everything that you've introduced so far and throw at him. And you have to keep in mind, too, that this is a young person that is not sophisticated in the ways of litigation, that is not going to be a sophisticated witness that knows how to maneuver verbally on the stand in front of a jury all of the traps that a skilled prosecutor is going to present for them in terms of how artfully questions are asked and how difficult it is to answer under stress, under rapid fire, under questioning in circumstances like this. And so certainly I think a defense attorney would argue to not have their client take the stand, but obviously they would make the argument that they may take the stand because you never want to tip your hand to prosecution to let them know that this is something that they don't have to worry about. And they have to prove their case to a certain degree and a level of satisfaction that addresses both the standards for what the law is and the subjective interpretation of what the jury is listening to. And so, yeah, there, there's so much at risk for putting a client on the stand. And you can literally undo all of the work that you've put in as an advocate when something like this happens. It, it really is nothing to be taken very lightly. And that's exactly the reason why you don't see very many defense attorneys doing it or many defendants taking the risk themselves that want to just tell their version or their side of the story.